And so there's taxation without representation. And then armies and navies beginning to assemble. In the meantime, in places like Virginia and Massachusetts and New York, various militia companies who'd been part of colonial defenses in French and Indian wars were beginning to get more serious about their work. And they were collecting powder, ammunition, cannon in some cases, muskets, getting ready for the possibility of war with Britain. They thought that was a real possibility. And in each colony, they had to make a decision as to whether they were going to do this arming and preparing for battle or not. Uh, maybe that was just too much in your face. Maybe we should just be more patient with the British. Now, in Virginia, in 1775, shortly before the uh, revolution began, they were having one of these debates in the Virginia legislature. And some people were saying, no, let's, let's, let's just take it easy. Britain's going to be our friends. Don't worry about it. Just don't push them too hard. Just petition and they'll give us redress. And others are saying, hey, this is going the wrong direction. We've got to do something about this. Uh, we're going to lose our rights if we don't resist. Now, Patrick Henry stood up, and in that image he's there, and here is basically what he said that day. First he says he's kind of being nice to the people that talked before, and says, but we do need a full debate. We've got to be frank about this. This is important. And then he says, look, my opponents, the people that are opposed to arming the militia and being ready to fight, urge and caution. They're saying we've petitioned and so on. Let's just just let King George take care of things. But, says he, we've already done that. We've done it. And it's just not getting us anywhere. It's not working. And the only alternative at this point is to fight. We've got to fight. Uh, and he says, we may lose. We, got it. we may lose. But it's still better to resist than not to resist. It's better to resist than just lie down and, and take it. Now, that is essentially a professor's summary of what happened. And I'm going to try to invoke the spirit of here of Patrick Henry. And I want to try to take you back to 1775. And he will deliver a speech to you in a moment. Yeah. And he will refer to you as gentlemen and gesture to somebody as Mr. President. Now, Mr. President is not the President of the United States. It's just a term for the director of the assembly where they're arguing. So that's what the Mr. President refers to. And he says, gentlemen, I apologize for the fact that women were not yet, were not yet uh, franchised and, and able to sit in, in, uh, in the house, but just think of yourselves as everyone being included in this. You are thinking about whether to resist or not. Does it make sense or not? A few years ago, John Adams, on a specific situation, Guys, uh, you ready for a few, few years before, John Adams, in a similar situation, said, hey, let's just cool it. Let's take it easy on the British. It's not entirely their fault what happened. So he's sort of facing that. And, and here's Patrick Henry. And just imagine me wearing a cloak like that and uh, maybe a, one of those ruffled scarves or whatever, having a different set of shoes. But uh, I'll do the best I can. Uh, and I'm listening, and some of you have been up there saying, hey, it's okay, don't worry, the British are not going to hurt us. They, they need their army, they need their navy it's to protect us. Uh, let's, just, let's just take things down a stage or two, and all will be well. And Patrick Henry is just kind of sitting there, and he's maybe writing down some notes, and he's just furious to get his word in, to get his chance. And after just sitting there, somebody, the president, comes to him and says, Mr. Henry, do you have something to say? He says, yes, I do. Mr. President, no man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism, as well as the abilities, of the very worthy gentleman who just addressed the House. But different men often see the same subject in different lights. And therefore, I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to me and to them if I should speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the House is one of awful moment to this country. 
For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. And in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Were I to hold back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offense, I would consider myself as guilty of treason toward my country and of an act of disloyalty to the majesty of heaven which I revere above all earthly kings. Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes to that truth and listen to the song of that siren until she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who having eyes see not? and having ears hear not, the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation. For my own part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am prepared to know the worst, to know the whole truth, and provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are bound, and that is the lamp of experience. I know no way of judging the future but by the past. And judging by the past, what has there been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves in the house? Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir! It will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed by a kiss. Ask yourselves how that gracious reception of our petition comports with these warlike preparations which cover our water and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? What have we done to deserve such treatment? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us to submission and slavery? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the globe to call for all this accumulation of armies and navies? No, sir, she has not. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. What have we to oppose them? Should we try arguing? We, sir, we've been trying that for the last 10 years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has all been in vain. We have petitioned. We have remonstrated. We have supplicated. We have prostrated ourselves before the throne to implore its interposition to arrest the tyrannical and of the ministry in Parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurred with contempt from the foot of the throne. It is vain after these things to indulge in the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, <coughs> If we mean to preserve in violent those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, and which we pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest will be attained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight and appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left to us. They tell us, sir, that we are unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when will we be stronger? Will it be next week or next year? Will we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Will we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope? 
until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot. Sure, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those aids which God has brought for us. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and possessing such a country as we possess are invincible by any force that the enemy shall send against us. Besides, we will not fight our battles alone. The victory is not to the strong alone, it is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the Congress. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking can be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come! I repeat it, sir, let it come. It is vain, sir, to extenuate the matter further. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here to idle? What is it that the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear? Or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, Almighty God! For me, give me liberty or give me death. Ready to join up and fight the British? <laughs> <laughs>